Hello, my name is Judith Hawley and I'm the chair for another in the London Luminaries lecture series. Before I introduce our speaker, let me tell you something about the London Luminaries as an organisation. We represent a group of 15 historic properties working together to explore the history of the West of London. Each property provides the speaker and the Luminaries supply a platform for them. We volunteer our time to organise, publicise and then edit the talks for our YouTube channel. We also arrange regular meetings with the Luminaries partners. Now to make sure that we're accessible to a larger and wider audience, we're delighted to announce that we're partnering with other organisations to share these talks with the vulnerable and homebound. If you'd like to support our work, do please make a donation through our new website. And our new website is where you can see previous talks in this and previous series. So as they say, without further ado, let me now introduce our speaker, Katie Hinchliffe. She's the Senior Visitor Experience Officer for Hogarth's House and Boston Manor House in the London Borough of Hounslow. She also freelances as both an independent art and social history lecturer and as a classically trained soprano soloist, most often and quite fittingly for this evening's talks at funerals. Katie's specialist subject is Victorian mourning and social etiquette. So her interest in mortality, morally good deaths and mourning provide an excellent context for her introduction to a slightly different side of Hogarth's modern moral series and what it meant to mourn in Georgian Britain. Over to you, Katie. Thank you so much, Judith, and thank you everyone for joining this evening. Um, all I can say is that I hope I do Hogarth proud. Um, so this evening, as Judith said, I will be speaking about morality and mortality, and I'll be looking at um, Hogarth's modern moral series. Um, not all of them, sadly, because again, we only really have an hour, including questions together, but we're going to be having a little peek at some of the series in which he portrayed the um, rise and swift downfall in the lives of those who chose vice over morals. So of course, it's going to be a little bit saucy this evening. Um, and then afterwards, I'm going to briefly touch on mourning in Georgian Britain. There's a lot to cover, but hopefully we'll cover as much as possible. So I'm going to assume that everybody that is in this talk this evening knows about the late great William Hogarth, but I am speaking to you from an extension at his house here in Chiswick. Um, he lived between Chiswick, which was his um, quiet country residential retreat, um, and Leicester Fields, which is now Leicester Square. So his house, his main house was where the Odeon is now. I like to say that he's probably literally rolling in his grave about a five minute walk from here because his quiet country retreat is now very much next to the Great West Road. But at the time, it was a very, very small little village um, surrounded by fields. What makes Hogarth so special, and we all know this already, is the fact that he was part of the heart of central London and he painted and depicted so many different people in so many different walks of life, um, whether you were rich, whether you were poor, whether you were young, old, all ethnicities, and as depicted here in Beer Street and Gin Lane, um, two of his most famous works, um, whether you were drunk on beer or drunk on gin, the morally good way of drinking or the morally bad way of drinking, um, he was there and he would remember you. And I think what's so special is that we can all kind of see ourselves and other people that we know in Hogarth's works even now. Um, so his modern moral subjects were almost like an 18th century comic strip, if we think about it that way. Um, they vary in terms of length. Most of them were either four or six plates, but there were some that were a little bit longer as well. Each one follows a distinctive pattern as well, and this will be a something that, that comes back throughout the ones that we're looking at this evening. Um, in the first image or the first plate, um, it shows the lead character or the lead characters as an innocent or at least without knowledge of what they're getting themselves into by being morally corrupt. Then by the middle of the series, they've essentially doomed themselves to their own demise because of the fact that they have given in to sin and vice or have become morally not quite as good as they were in the first plate. Um, and they're partaking in some sort of, of course, some sort of vice that will um, lead to their downfall. 
And then in the last plate of the series, um, it shows their eventual repercussions from allowing this vice to take over their lives. Um, and in most cases, this means that they themselves pass away or essentially end up in a fate that is worse than death. Hogarth poses a really interesting question to the viewer. What happens when the person who has died is not a morally good person? Do we mourn them? or do we simply stand by and watch the action happen? The answer is in reality, it's much more nuanced than we can really anticipate. I'm not going to put the Modern Moral series in chronological order, but I'm going to put it in the order of what I think makes for the best telling of Hogarth's perspectives on morality and how we may question a justifiable means to an end. The three points that I think really play a part throughout all of these works um, are power, social influence, and money are the three reasons that anyone during the Modern Moral series find themselves um, having a swift rise and an even faster downfall. These are the key elements that affect the players in the Modern Moral series themselves. Um, so we're going to go on to our first one. I'm not going to go into the full series, um, but this is Industry and Idleness. And it, um, it dates from 1747. So it's um, about a decade after A Harlot's Progress comes out as the first modern moral series. Um, I think it's a good place to start as the morals of the two leading men in the series are very clearly laid out for the viewer to see. And in return, their downfall and their rise to power are very, very clear from the get-go. So on the left-hand side here of the screen, we have um, Tom Idle. Tom is used a lot in the names of people who uh, are not morally as good as other people in, in other series. So I'm not sure if Hogarth knew someone that, that was named Tom that he wanted to get back at or not, but I just find it very interesting. Anyway, Tom Idle is on the left-hand side and his um, fellow apprentice, Francis Goodchild is on the right-hand side. And of course, notice their names, Tom Idle and Francis Goodchild. Of course, all of the names are very, very on the nose. Uh, Tom Idle is literally asleep at his loom and there's a cat playing with the loom next to him and he is not doing his work as he is being instructed. The instructor is on the right-hand side of the frame and is obviously shooting daggers at him because he's so annoyed that Thomas or that Tom Idle is not doing his work. Meanwhile, Francis Goodchild is industrious um, and he is able to finish his work, do a, a wonderful job. And this is, um, again, the first plate. This is the first time that we see them. What differentiates this modern moral series from the rest is the fact that we see that there is a already an established good and bad player in this. Tom Idle represents morally corrupt and um, Francis Goodchild represents the morally good essentially. Um, but also notice the frames. So these frames um, appear in plates one to 10. And they also symbolize what is about to happen. On the left hand side over Tom, you have um, hanging ropes, and essentially devices used for torture used for people who are going to be arrested. And over top of Francis, you have a crown and scepter. So this is going to very much play into their future lives. Now I'm skipping ahead because as I said, I can't go through all of the plates for this one, um, but I'm giving you a massive spoiler alert. Thomas Idol is shown to essentially fall from plate one. He gets um, arrested multiple times. He is seen with people that are very willing to turn him in for a quick buck, essentially. And he ends up, again, in plate 10, so this is, this is the plate just before these two, um, in front of Francis Goodchild, who has become an alderman. So despite the fact that they knew each other when they were both on equal footing, both on equal work, um, and could have had the same outcome, um, Francis Goodchild has essentially had to sentence uh, Thomas Idle to die. Thomas Idle, you can see in the cart 
um, on the kind of like left of center of the um, plate 11 on the left hand side. He's literally leaning on his own coffin um, that says TI on it. Um, and he is reading a passage from the Bible and a Methodist preacher is um, speaking to him and essentially giving him his last rites. This is a really, really interesting plate as well because you also see the um, trifold Tyburn tree. So this is where people were hanged um, at Tyburn, which ends up being part of Hyde Park now. Um, but there are also very, very famous people um, or players during the day. So you've got a woman right in the front with a baby um, and she is selling essentially Thomas Idol's last words, which had not even been spoken yet, but she's written them up and people ate it up. Um, and someone else that is very interestingly shown in the engraving itself on the bottom right hand side is someone colloquially named Titty Doll who sold gingerbread at these sorts of events. Um, and we know that he exists because of Hogarth, which I think is wonderful. But again, notice the frame, it's two hanging skeletons. So just in case you didn't know what was happening, Hogarth's made it very, very, very plain for you. This isn't good. I should have mentioned as well at the bottom, there's a uh, usually a Proverbs quotation um, or a Proverbs chapter that is noted that kind of plays on the action of what is happening in the scene above. Um, in, in each plate as well. And on the note of the hanging skeletons, just for Hogarth in general, with any of his engravings especially, or paintings which are turned into engravings, nothing is put there without thought or without purpose. And again, sadly, we don't have hours and hours and hours to go fully into detail about everything that Hogarth is depicting, but it's worth making note of interesting, strange things that you see throughout any of the works that I show you tonight or more, um, please come to the house and you can see more on display. But he's very carefully chosen to depict what he shows. Anyway, on the right-hand side, you then have the industrious Prentice, Francis Goodchild, then becoming Lord Mayor of London. So again, very much in stark contrast between Thomas Idol, who has just been sentenced to death for burglary and then a, a murder that has taken place and some of his colleagues have sold him out to the crown. Um, and then uh, Francis Goodchild for his good work has then become um, Lord Mayor of London. And again, in the frame, you can see the cornucopia that is um, being presented essentially to represent um, the celebrations that are happening. Now, I'm going to go on to one of the um, most famous um, modern moral series, and that is The Rake's Progress. Um, we're going to jump back in time um, a little bit for this. So this came right after The Harlot's Progress was published in the 1730s. So this was actually published on um, the 25th of June, 1735, and it's the same day that the essentially what was known as the Hogarth's Act or the Engraver's Copyright Act came out, um, and it was a way of protecting engravers and people who produced um, engraved art so that their work was not plagiarized or copied in the same way or in the same manner that it had been previously a number of Hogarth's works, as well as, you know, including his um, paintings and his engravings were copied and mimicked and sold to, um, to the hungry public who wanted a piece of the action themselves. Um, so this is really, really a mo monumentous occasion for Hogarth in, you know, creating a better um, working practice for people that were engravers like himself. So with a rake's progress, um, this is another spoiler alert, it doesn't actually result in our tragic hero, another Tom, Tom Rakewell, um, dying. Um, however, as I said, um, some of them end with a fate worse than death. Tom, you'll see in a few minutes, ends up in um, Bethlehem and becomes one of the people that is, is someone that is looked upon by the upper echelons of society as a form of entertainment because he has gone mad, which 
again, is very much a commentary on um, social life at the time in the 18th century. So again, from the first plate, um, we as the viewer are immediately part of the action here. However, and this statement is true for all the modern moral subjects, there's an event in the first plate of the following three modern moral subjects here, which directly affects the moral quandary and sound judgment of our leading men and women. And this is exactly what Hogarth wants to challenge us with. Um, what would we personally do in their circumstance? If there's any question of moral ambiguity, it's from our first glimpse into their life that we can start to see the downfall, despite the fact that they have turned a blind eye to the possibility of their fate becoming disastrous. So again, as I said previously, Tom in plate one begins as an innocent. His father, who was extremely thrifty and extremely essentially tight with money, has inherited this wealth that he doesn't know what to do with. And essentially this money that is literally falling out of the ceiling, as you can see in the first plate, has been essentially thrust upon him. And he is not prepared to deal with this sort of change in his life. On the right hand side, you can see a woman named Sarah Young um, and she's holding a ring. And so Tom, presumably, as you can read into it, has proposed to Sarah, um, who is also carrying his, his child at this point in the, um, in the series. Reading into this, you can see that obviously she's distressed and upset and her mother is beside her holding all of the love letters from Tom. And he is saying, essentially, um, now that I am a man of wealth, I cannot be marrying someone who is common like yourself. So immediately, the viewer sees that there is something that has happened that this change in his life, this change of immediate wealth and immediate social class uprising for him um, has created this morally difficult or morally wrong conversation that he is then having with someone that he was about to marry, which is extremely difficult. It's worth it to mention again, so keep in mind the three principles that I've identified um, as reasons for the moral downfall in the modern moral subjects. This is power, social influence, and money, and they come back time and time and time again. Um, and again, remember that Hogarth carefully places symbols throughout each plate, um, some which are more obvious than others, which symbolize what's happening in the direct action of each image, and some which are more hidden and foretell what is to come. Do pay attention as I'm flipping through the slides so that you can have a really, really good look at what is happening. So yes, so as we have mentioned um, in the first plate here on the left-hand side, we have Tom Rakewell inheriting the money from his father. And the first plate is called the heir. You've got people all around him immediately measuring him for suits. You've got people counting his money on the table there, making sure that he's got everything that he needs, um, going through his accounts, making sure that he perfectly understands what is happening and what is about to happen as well. Um, and as I <laughs> very briefly mentioned, it always makes me laugh to look at it. There's literally money falling out of the ceiling because his father hid money all over the house one would presume. In the second plate, um, notice how different his life has already become. So um, the second plate is called the Levee, and he has completely changed his character. So Tom is surrounded by the sorts of people who are going to teach him how to become the sort of aristocrat that he has now um, got the money to, to become. He's got someone that is a dance master. He has um, a swordsman that is going to teach him how to, how to duel properly. He's got someone at the uh, keyboard there or at the harpsichord um, who the rumor is that it's supposed to be based on Handel. I would love to believe that it's Handel. And the scroll behind him are all of the um, patrons that are mostly names of Castrati that, that he was working with. So he's, he's very, very high up in the social echelons already, even though this is very, very early on in the plate. 
but notice the things around him in the room, such as the artwork. Um, you've got a rooster there and you can kind of maybe put two and two together with what Hogarth was alluding to in his change of mannerism and change of um, deportment as well. And you've got a number of men in the background as well that are not paying attention to the immediate action. But what are they talking about and who are they talking to? Because you can see a woman there um, and one can assume that that is Sarah that has come to speak directly to Tom. So then we go on to plates three and four. Um, plate three is colloquially known as the orgy, which I absolutely love. Um, so this is at a wild party or what was known at the time as an orgy in a brothel in Covent Garden. And Tom is to the left of center, um, enjoying every single moment of it. But as you can tell, though he is there, he is not mentally there. He is um, holding a drinks glass, presumably um, either gin or brandy, and he is surrounded by women that are taking advantage of him. Um, so there's a woman that is reaching into his shirt while another woman takes his, um, takes his pocket watch. So the woman reaching into his shirt essentially is pickpocketing him, but he doesn't realize that because he thinks that she's going to do something else. He's in a state of kind of various undress. Um, so one can assume that he's been having a good time as well. And you have a number of um, women doing other things like pulling up their own stockings. There's another woman at the back that's spitting at another um, person across the table. Um, and there are people coming into the scene too. And what I think is so brilliant about these um, Hogarthian scenes essentially is the fact that there is so much movement. And again, you can really get a sense that you yourself are there. Though you're kind of looking from the fourth essentially from the fourth wall, you're looking in on the scene and you think this is definitely something that I can put myself into. And I think that that's the, you know, that's the appeal of Hogarth. You can really place yourself in what's happening here. And then um, in plate four, you have the arrest. Um, and this is actually happening on St. David's Day. And we know that because there are bailiffs that are wearing leeks in their hats um, for St. David's Day. So they are the Welsh Guards. And it's happening at St. James's Palace. Um, this is also Queen Caroline's birthday. He has been stopped essentially because he hasn't been paying his bills. And just in case you didn't, you know, foresee how... Um, how terrible and how um, foreboding the subject is. Hogarth has literally spelled it out for you with lightning flashing across the sky. Um, the only person there that is once again showing up in the, in the plate to Tom's defense is Sarah um, and she is there to rescue him. I think it's, it's, also worth it to note that the only person um, throughout this modern moral subject that truly cares about Tom is Sarah, and she is the one person that he ignores blatantly the entire time. And you can notice how she is dressed um, in contrast to everybody else in the scene. She's wearing a lot of white so that the viewer is immediately drawn to her, which is, which is amazing. But again, what's so fascinating about Hogarth's prints in general, and this goes for all of the modern moral subjects, is the fact that because they take place in London, you can really put yourself in the action now. And for example, at St. James's Palace, a lot of the architecture is very, very similar. So you can imagine this happening at the time. So then we're going to move on to um, plates five and six. This is the marriage um, plate five on the left-hand side. Um, Tom has attempted to save his fortune by marrying a half-blind old widow. Um, and this is uh, mirrored in <laughs> two of my favorite dogs in any Hogarth print um, in a pug and some sort of possibly, I possibly terrier spaniel mix thing on the left hand side there um, but the pug ever showing up in Hogarth um, as a sign of a mischievous goings on which which I think we all love. Sarah once again is part of this action and as you can see at the back um, there is a fight that is ensuing amongst the women that um, that have come in for this wedding and 
as you can see, Tom is not actually looking at his uh, new bride, but he's paying attention to a woman that is fixing the the, uh, the bride's dress, who we would assume is her maid. So he's already moved on to his next victim, essentially, um, which again is very indicative of the fact that he's already, you know, moved on to how he's going to spend the money, how he is going to ruin the lives of the people that he's ensnared into his life of, of ruin, essentially. The next slide on the right-hand side is called The Gaming House. Um, so it's the sixth in the series itself. And it's uh, Tom is essentially, um, at this point, it's taken up to flight six for this to happen. He is pleading with God um, for help. And it's kind of a, an allusion to the fact that it's a little too late at this point. He's thrown his wig on the floor um, and has obviously shaved his head in, in the fashion that was very popular at the time. Um, but he has lost all of his money, which is now the money of the old maid. And he is essentially pleading with God to help him. Um, but again, it's a little too late. And this is his last and final plea, essentially, before something drastic has to happen, um, which we then see in the next plate. So then in number seven here um, on the left-hand side, this is called the prison. Um, so he is essentially incarcerated in Fleet Debtors Prison, um, which similarly interestingly to um, Charles Dickens' father. Um, Hogarth's father was also in debtor's prison and he grew up um, extremely destitute, but then became, um, became rich because of, or not rich, but comfortable um, because of his own, um, because of his own talents and, and his ability to depict um, London social life. Anyway, Tom is in, debtor's prison himself, and he is not looking remorse in any way for anything except for himself. Um, Sarah on the left-hand side has completely fainted. Um, as you can see, there's someone holding smelling salts in front of her face to try to revive her, and their child um, is yelling at her to wake up, but Tom is just not interested in anything that is happening there he has started to lose it and he has started to realize that there is something morally wrong with him but again as said in in plate six it's a little too late at this point um do notice on the left hand side above sarah that there is um that kind of um, imagery of the wings and the halo again, to symbolize the fact that she is the moral good. She is the one that could have saved Tom. And then on the right-hand side, we have the final plate, um, and this is called the Madhouse. So Tom is in the forefront. He has completely gone mad at this point. Um, and we see some of the other prisoners or some of the other people in the Madhouse as well. We have someone um, who believes that they are king and you can see him sitting at the back with a crown there is someone else who um believes that they are god incarnate or believes that they are are some sort of version of jesus and they are um in one of the cells on the left hand side as well and sarah once again has come to tom to try to save him but again he is past saving at this point and it's been made very very clear that there is nothing that can be done to help him. Um, Sarah has tried throughout the series, but again, even now he's not paying attention to her and he is um, he has nothing else that he can be doing. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, he then becomes fodder for the upper classes who at the time did go to Bedlam or Bethlehem to view people that were living there and they are towards the essentially upstage of um, the action watching everybody um, essentially all the fools around them and uh, Tom has become essentially a, a reason for ridicule so he's gone from becoming a, a member of the aristocracy to someone that the aristocracy laughs at 
On that depressing note, we're going to start with another one. <laughs> so um, this is, again, something that you need to remember in your mind is power, social influence, and money. And so the um, this is Marigella Mode. Uh, it was painted between 1743 and 1745, and the paintings themselves are in the National Gallery. I should have said that the Rake's Progress um, is on display. Uh, the paintings are in the um, Sony Museum. The engravings for Marriage Alla Mode were engraved shortly after they were painted, um, and there were a number of people who engraved them for Hogarth. So he um, he employed people to engrave them for him, um, and the ones that I'm showing were engraved by Bernard Barron at the time. Um, so this series was created with a specific intention of satirizing marriages for political or financial gain. So in other words, arranged marriages amongst the upper echelons of society. Um, and again, from plate one, we can see that the destiny of the two tragic figures who are to become the V-Count and the V-Countess Squanderfield, again, very good name, Squanderfield. So Earl Squanderfield, father of the groom, um, has a title but has spent all of his money and the father of the bride, a city merchant with no title but lots of money, are striking up the marriage deal while their son and daughter, posed at the right-hand side of the image, this is on, left, on the left-hand side, um, are literally shown with their backs to one another. The V-Count is looking in the mirror at his reflection, um, but the viewer sees the reflection of Silvertongue, who is their lawyer, um, who's chatting up the V-Countess. And noticeably, there are two dogs chained together on the right-hand side of the frame. There's always dogs, always dogs. <laughs> Look for the dogs. Um, overall, the downfall of the V-Count, and I think that this is really interesting, is because of his lack of social influence and obsession with spending money. And fatally, um, because he is essentially emasculated by his adulterous wife, who, um, who essentially has a downfall because of her rise in power and social influence. It's all about knowing where you were supposed to be morally um, before you can safely climb the social ladder. And essentially climbing without a moral safety net means death. And that is something that we need to remember in these, um, in these series. In the second plate, the Squanderfields are now officially V-Count and V-Countess. Um, and they have just been wed, they've been wed for a little while. Um, the V-Count who already had um, essentially the markings of syphilis in the first plate, as you can see on his neck, it's front and center uh, in plate two. Um, once again, as I said, look for the dog. The dog at his right-hand side is pulling a nightcap out of his coat pocket. So obviously he's been up to something um, the night before and his sword is lying at his feet. So it's it's a symbol of maybe like a lost duel, but again, um, this the sense of being emasculated by his wife. Meanwhile, his wife is stretching and looking at something that is beyond the viewer's essentially viewpoint she, and she has a little pocket mirror that she has above her so we don't know if she's maybe making um, some sort of signal to someone that is just beyond the frame but she looks very content with herself so again this is the first viewings of maybe something is happening but neither one of them is paying attention to one another and maybe if they did that's when the issues um, would have stopped. One of their servants is in the foreground and he is walking away um, with one of the best Hogarthian expressions I love. Um, but he is uh, holding a stack of unpaid bills. So immediately we can see that they are living in a very, very lush, luxurious house um, filled with um, essentially crap that I love. But crap. Um, and uh, their servant is not being, you know, being able to pay the bills for the things that are essential in their life. Um, next, we're going on to plates three and four. Again, we need to look at this. It's sometimes with Hogarth, Hogarth's work and, and essentially any work realistically, um, we need to remember that this was depicted with an 18th century eye, um, which is obviously very different than a 21st century eye. However, even 300 years ago, there are certain subjects that were extremely taboo and were extremely frowned upon. 
Um, and one of those is very clearly apparent in plate three. Um, so the V count has gone to essentially a quack doctor who has been able to um, advertise his wares for uh, curing syphilis. So once again, you have the V count with his um, patches on his neck. Um, but next to him is a young girl who is dabbing at her lip and the viewer can either read this, um, you know, a, a few different ways, one of which is that he's given syphilis to her or that um, she has inherited syphilis from her parents and it is something that the V-Count is trying to essentially pay for her to uh, recover from so that he can have a ward in very loose quotation marks that he can then spend more money on in other ways. Um, the woman at the back holding the knife is a questionable figure. Uh, it's generally believed that it, it could be the girl's mother, whether or not she's, uh, she's angry at the V count because of the fact that he's given her syphilis or the fact that he is essentially paying for her daughter to, um, to be with him is another, um, is another question. But this, in a nutshell, this whole image really shows the desperation of the V count and the fact that he is living in a completely immoral world. Meanwhile, in plate four, we see the, the Vicountess, um, and she has surrounded herself with the um, highlights of society. But what's really interesting here is that a number of these people are not native to, to Britain. Um, she is on the left-hand side speaking to Silver Tongue, so again, the lawyer. Um, but you have someone that is singing um, who is um, a castrato. So as I mentioned in the Riggs Progress, we had a list of castrati that, um, that were patrons to someone who could have been handled. Um, and you have um, behind the countess, someone that's doing her hair. So essentially it's mentioned that it could be a French hairstylist. Um, and next to him in the white gown is someone that is um, absolutely adoring the castrato um, who's come over from Italy. So these are all the sorts of things that the Vicount does not know are happening in his own home, um, but the Vicountess are, you know, is, is paying for all of these foreign services and foreign people to come into her home for a different reason to, um, you know, boost herself up in society. But because of that social influence, she's become too popular. And then in um, scenes five and six, Silver Tongue um, has been caught dallying with the Vicontess. Um, Silver Tongue is uh, interestingly escaping out the window in, um, in a very interesting pose and uh, very scantily clad. So we can assume we know what's happened here. And the Vicontess um, is kneeling as though she is praying to, you know, praying to a saint um, at the feet of her husband who has been stabbed by Silver Tongue um, fatally. It's really interesting, this, this pose that uh, Hogarth has decided to depict the Vicont in because it's very similar to Jesus being taken off of the cross and essentially the Vicontess in that manner becomes like Mary Magdalene. And then in the last plate, the Vicontess um, has been told of the, the news that Silvertongue um, has been killed, has been executed for the murder of her husband, and her husband is now dead, and she has no money. Um, and there are a number of symbols around the room, especially the skeletal dog at the table, um, that show this. But the saddest symbol in the work itself, and probably out of the entire series, um, is the little girl that is at the Vicontess's lap that is giving her one last kiss. This is the only heir that has come out of their union. Um, and you can see through very, very small symbols like a little brace on the leg and patches um, on, on the child that the only thing that she has inherited from her parents is hereditary syphilis. So it's um, it's an extremely upsetting and sad way to end. But again, this is um, a moral tale. 
Um, I want to talk about Georgia Morning very quickly. So this image comes from 1733. So around the time that um, Hogarth obviously is depicting morality in his series itself. Um, again, there's this notion that when someone dies, we remember the great and the good, and we mourn them for that. Um, all ill is forgotten and all immoral behavior can be shaken off to a certain degree. Um, but if you're mostly morally you know, good in your lifetime, then you would be remembered well. Um, and this is an idea that became an obsession with like the good death and being remembered properly and being properly mourned in the 19th century. The Georgian period is the first period in which um, we start to see mourning garments um, being worn by especially the aristocracy. Um, but because of the emerging middle classes, which again, become absolutely massive in the 19th century, and advancements in textile production, and especially in dyeing, um, D-Y-E-I-N-G, <laughs> um, clothing, um, black, it, it um, has a direct effect on um, women's garments at the time. It was actually noted as well by a number of aristocratic women that they thought that black was very becoming with their complexion. So even at that point, everybody thought that they looked best in black. Um, anyway, on the left-hand side, uh, we see Infanta Doña Margarita in Spain in about 1665. And then um, on the right-hand side, um, we have another Habsburg, we have Empress Maria Theresa um, in Austria in 1772. And then in the middle, um, we have Sarah Duchess of Marlborough in 1722, um, obviously wearing something that the Victorians would have absolutely been shocked by, an extremely low cut garment. But as you can see, um, even though it's all mourning clothing, it's all black, um, it's been directly affected by the fashions of the day. Um, this is also the first time that we see specific mourning houses, which become um, absolutely massive in the 19th century, especially on German Street. Um, but this is a time when you could either dye the clothing that you already owned black, um, and a number of people did and um, would use um, dyes that had iron ore in them, um, which would then later on turn the um, garments like a rusty color, or you could go see someone specifically that would create um, items for you. Um, interestingly, this funeral house card comes from Matthias Otto. As you can see, um, it was from uh, Bowling Court in the Strand, um, and he specialized in clothing for um, essentially the royal widow, which became all of the fashion when the middle classes had more money to burn. Um, these are all on display. Most are on display um, at the VNA and their online collections are absolutely wonderful. They're all um, mourning rings or brooches from um, around 1680 to about, um, I, I would say about 1810 that I was that I was searching for. But this is the um, this is the time when morning brooches or sorry morning jewelry comes into fashion, even more than morning clothing itself. You have to remember that the average age of an average Londoner was around 40 at the time um, that Hogarth was living. So the fact that he died when he was 67 is quite, a, quite an achievement. Um, but by using things like hair that you, know, you could keep from um, someone who was deceased that you wanted to remember, this was something that was so interestingly you know, pliable and you could create great works of art with it um, from, from plating it to, um, as you can see, there's at the bottom there, there's a brooch that has the plating around the outside and, and something that looks like a, a sheath of wheat as well. Um, and then kind of like the, the curls, which then become the Prince of Wales curls in the 19th century. Um, and these are all absolutely amazing. But as I said, please do have a look online. They're both in the jewelry galleries as well as um, the British galleries, but they kind of came out of this obsession with memento mori or remembering you must die. And there was a lot of jewelry that existed, especially in the 17th and, um, 17th and early 18th centuries um, that wearers would, or the people would wear daily or at least very frequently that would give you that remembrance to live a, to live a good life and to make sure that 
you know, you were doing something to live your fullest, um, to live to your fullest every day, morally, we would assume. But that's what makes it so lucky that we have this item on display at um, Hogarth's house uh, itself. We are lucky enough that um, Aberdeen Council has um, given it to us on permanent loan. Um, it is the memorial ring for um, Jane Hogarth when she passed away in 1789 at the age of 80, which is quite amazing. As you can see on the left-hand side, it says, in life beloved, in death lamented. Um, there's someone underneath a willow and you have a funerary morning, um, a funerary urn that um, this person's lamenting next to. And the, um, the ring itself uh, is surrounded by seed pearls. Um, this is a time when, you know, again, the middle classes were more able to um, pay for luxuries like this. And this is something that the family could hold dear to themselves. And wonderfully, it's ended up back in our collection in, in, a, so in a sort of way. Hogarth himself had a really interesting last day. Um, he traveled from Chiswick to Leicester Fields and was physically not feeling wonderful. He was, he was declining steadily in his last few years, um, but he was in, in morally um, and mentally high spirits. So he traveled back to Leicester Fields and two very exciting things happened that day. One, he received a letter from Benjamin Franklin, which he was in the process of writing back to. Um, and two, he said in his, um, essentially in his accounts that he ate uh, two pounds of beef um, and as a member, well, a founding member of the Beef State Club, um, I think that that is the proudest way to die. Um, however, it must be said that uh, he was also violently ill that evening um, and proceeded to vomit all of it up shortly before he passed away. It said that he had a bell that he would ring for his um, servants, and he rang it so, so hard that they said that the bell itself broke. They're, we're not quite sure how he himself passed away, but um, it said that um, he passed away because of an aneurysm. Um, and again, he was 67 and lived a great life. I have to thank the incomparable uh, Val Bott, um, who, if you live in Chiswick, you know of Val or you know Val, um, but she was able to send me these images um, of Hogarth's tomb, um, which is at the wonderful St. Nicholas Church, and you should definitely check out their programming as well. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, but Hogarth, uh, when he passed away, did not have enough money to be able to afford a monument for himself. Um, so David Garrick, uh, one of his best friends, um, petitioned his friends and, and Hogarth fans to pay a subscription um, into paying for this monument. And this is what was created. And it was gilded on top, which I think is wonderful. And David Garrick actually wrote the um, monument inscription on the tomb itself. On the left-hand side is the bathos, which is Hogarth's last work. Um, and he himself didn't end up doing what he wanted, what he wanted to do with his life. And that was to um, create this great English school of painting. Um, so this is a commentary on the fact that he essentially felt like a failure. Um, and he knew that his life was about to end and this was his last work itself. And he created it as the end piece for um, a bound collection of his works. But I think Hogarth, by his own admission, would say that he was not morally good or, you know, completely morally sound. But I think that we can all agree that um, he had a wonderful life and, and we really thank him for what he did while he was alive, which then begs the question, how are we ourselves going to be remembered when we pass on? Thank you, Katie. That that was a, a, amazing. It's so good to hear about Hogarth in detail. The, 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 the paintings and the engravings really do need a lot of unpacking, don't they? Because they do have um, so much information in them. There are um, two more talks coming up. One tomorrow, Alexis Haslam will be doing a fantastic talk about Fulham Palace. And then we have a short break until the 15th of November when we have two speakers, two for the price of one, wonderful speakers from Kew Palace and Strawberry Hill House and Gardens. 